Good evening, everyone. My name is Deepa Govindarajan Driver. I'm a university lecturer and trade unionist. And I welcome you to this event, which is, in a sense, looking at the issues around the, the blood sport, that is the persecution of Julian Assange. The case of Julian Assange sets a number of issues in, uh, into the spotlight. These include the suppression of dissent, the extraterritorial reach of the US state to prosecute a non-US citizen for actions taken in a jurisdiction by a non-US citizen in a jurisdiction where those actions are legal. Um, it sets precedence in terms of the freedom of people to know the crimes that their governments commit in their name. It sets various precedents around the freedom of the press and tells you a lot about democracy, the press, and the state of our nation in terms of how we look at coordinated actions by states to persecute one individual for revealing war crimes. It also sets precedents in relation to states, our acceptance of state-sponsored torture and the disregard by the British state of international law, of British law. It is therefore my pleasure to welcome this August panel um, to discuss these issues. At the far right, we have Tim Dawson, who's a national executive member of the National Union of J Journalists, a fellow trade unionist, and a member of the International Federation of Journalists. Both unions have made their opposition to the extradition of Julian Assange very clear, and we're very happy to hear from you, Tim, this evening. To his left is the great Tariq Ali, writer and broadcaster, and co-editor of the book in defense of Julian Assange. To Tariq's left is Jen Robinson, lawyer extraordinaire from Julian Assange's legal team. And then the superstar from the, from the UN, <laughs> Professor Niels Meltzer, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. To Niels's left is Kristen Hrafnason, editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, the organization that brings to us details of the crimes that our governments commit behind closed doors and our corporations commit behind closed doors. Somewhere along the way, we will be joined by John McDonnell MP and Richard Bergen MP, and I'll introduce you to them once they arrive. I'd like to start by inviting Tim to offer a few words to you. Thank you very much. It's fantastic to see such a turnout. Um, I, I, I intervened at a meeting this afternoon on the subject that I'm about to speak about, uh, and after I sat down, Vivian Westwood grabbed my arm and said, that was brilliant, <coughs> which I have to confess for an old punk rocker is kind of the highest praise that you can conceivably imagine of. And if I, if I delight you half as much, then um, I'll be very pleased with myself indeed. Had I been a bit more quick-witted, I would have suggested perhaps that she could design some garments that we could all wear to visibly express uh, our support for a cause to which she is clearly very committed. Um, I, I noticed some comments at the weekend uh, from Gary Jones, the editor of the Daily Express. Um, and he, he said, I'm not really very comfortable describing Julian Assange as a journalist, which is disappointing, but I think he probably does express uh, quite a commonly held dis uh, unease uh, among other members of my profession. But I have a simple message for them, and it's that that concern is completely irrelevant. It matters not one jot in the context of what we're considering at the moment. Equally irrelevant, I think, is whether you think Julian Assange seems like a nice person or somebody you'd like to hang out with. I'm not belittling at all the um, accusations that he did face in Sweden, but they're not being pursued, and they're not what is facing us at this moment. 
What's facing us at this moment, it seems to me, is the most monstrous judicial attack on someone for publishing information that, frankly, I can imagine. We're seeing laws that have never been used before to threaten an individual with a prison sentence which is clearly many multiples of his or anybody's lifetime. To me, that's an assault on global civil liberties that I simply don't think we can leave unremarked upon. Uh, indeed, I think we should be protesting uh, as loudly as we're able because while if... If Julian is extradited and prosecuted and ends up in prison, that will be a terrible stain on, on all of us, I think, on, on humanity and a, and a monstrous injustice on him. The damage that it will do more broadly is far, far more serious. It will clearly create a chill on journalists all over the world. The idea that from another country they can be snatched and prosecuted under bizarre and archaic laws that have never been used before, that haven't even been tested in the Supreme Court of the country from which they originate, is one that will, will, will affect, I think, any journalist considering writing serious journalism about national security matters, about defence matters, about the way in which governments prosecute war on our behalf. And make no mistake, from the revelations for which Julian played a part in bringing to the public, we know, we know that terrible, terrible things have been done in our name. And unless we continue to track what governments are doing in our name and to try and stop that, then we'll be in a position where any sense that we live in a democratic society, in democratic countries, and in a democratic world will, will, will be finished. If this prosecution goes ahead, the damage to press freedom is not something I don't think that we will see turned back for decades to come. So I appeal to everybody, don't give any consideration to Julian the person. Con concentrate yourself on the charges that he's facing and the opposition that we need to build. We need to build it in the media, we need to build it among our politicians, we need to build it so that it feels completely unacceptable for this atrocious judicial process to proceed. And hopefully, hopefully, finally, somebody will see sense and say, we need to stop. I know, I know it's a familiar trope uh, in progressive circles to say, if this happens now, then something else will happen in the future. And, you know, a dystopian set of chain reactions uh, are, 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 are imagined. Well, there's no dystopia about this. In 2017, Theresa May ordered the Law Commission to draw up some uh, proposals to renew the Official Secrets Act. And those proposals would allow for not only the prosecution of somebody who'd signed the Official Secrets Act to be prosecuted in the event of a leak, but the journalist who received that information. They were shelved in the chaos of Brexit and in the, in the uncertainty of not having a majority government, but make no mistake, we live in deeply illiberal times. The instincts of Boris Johnson are quite clear. He, he went through the election making threats to public service broadcasters. He fell out with the lobby yesterday because he was expecting to pick and choose which of them received government briefings. Make no mistake, if this is allowed to happen now, in this country, the government will act to start tightening down on press freedom and to limit the free flow of information that we all require to hold politicians to account. Please join with me, my own union, the National Union of Journalists, and with the 600,000 members of the International Federation of Journalists in saying we will not allow this to pass. invite Kristen Hafnerson. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, it's heartening to see so many uh, who are interested in this case, uh, which is of such utmost importance. I visited Julian on, on Sunday and it was uh, good to see that he is a little better after he was moved out of the uh, isolation in the health ward. That was, of course, a result of a lot of pressure uh, by the lawyers, mostly behind the scenes, pressure from the general public, and interesting enough, because the, the, the inmates in Belmar's prison petitioned for his release. That is remarkable and inspiring.
We live in a world where the prisoner in Belmars have more humanity than uh, most people in government here. That's, that's uh, <laughs> But as I, uh, it's always difficult to leave him behind when you exit and go out of Belmars prison. It's, it's always your heart sinks uh, to, uh, to uh, know that, that he has to spend more time there. Uh, and I was standing there outside the Belmars and uh, watching back on these ugly walls surrounding the prison. And I was thinking about the walls and history. We recently celebrated that it was 30 years since a wall was torn down, a wall that was uh, raised to uh, imprison people, to keep them inside, and to keep the truth on the outside. The wall in Belmars is keeping a man on the inside who exposed the truth to us. How on earth did we come to this position that we have to fight for the freedom of an in innocent man, a journalist who exposed the truth? That is a serious thing that uh, we are now facing. And uh, in three weeks, of course, we are we're going to the, through the hearings. Uh, the, uh, the opposition, the United States government has uh, shown some of its hand what they what they're going to maintain and it's it's alarming to read through uh, these documents it's alarming on many reasons of course they maintain that he is not a journalist to start with which is outrageous it's outrageous that some actually in journalism are still maintaining that they have some qualms about accepting him as a journalist i say it's outrageous we're talking about a man who's been a, a card holding member of the journalist union of australia meaa for more than a decade it's outrageous to call man a non-journalist who had received the highest journalistic award uh, bestowed in his country the walkley award which is the equivalent of the pulitzer prize it's outrageous that somebody will maintain that he's not a journalist a man that has and the organization that uh, that he uh, was, was uh, uh, found, founded and is editor of, uh, received uh, almost two dozen awards since then for the publications, for the achievement. So of course he's a journalist. And we don't want to live in a society where, where Trump or Pompeo decides who is a journalist or not, or for that matter, Boris Johnson. If you give that power to, uh, to the political elite, that is basically taking away a lot of press freedom. That's basically giving them the power to decide what is news and what is not. So it's outrageous to see that. But of more concern is that it is maintained in these documents that were submitted uh, just recently, only about a week ago, that uh, they are of the opinion, the Americans, that the First Amendment protection does not apply to foreign nationals. Does not apply to foreign nationals. What does that mean? It means that on the same time that they are taking, uh, deciding that they can go after any journalist anywhere in the world, at the same time they decide that they are saying that all non-US journalists, all foreign journalists, do not have First Amendment protection. That is outrageous. It is totally outrageous and put everybody, every journalist at risk, who is covering national security issues, who are covering anything that might uh, embarrass the United States and uh, that they might perceive as being in opposition to their interest. That is of very serious concern. They also outline what kind of condition, condition Julian can expect if he is renditioned to the United States. We are talking about solitary confinement and they admit it. They don't call it solitary confinement. We don't call it solitary, solitary confinement, they say. We call it just special administrative measures. And we know all these wordplay. I mean, what do they call torture? No, enhanced interrogation technique. So he is facing terrible condition and a certain death in America if he's extradited. And of course, it will be a huge battle uh, ahead. Uh, I'm sure that Jennifer will talk about the, the, the precedent being set here for journalists, which is extremely serious. This is a basic attack on press freedom. It is outlined that there has been a lot of harm done by the publication of 2010-11. An, an entire decade has passed and they've not been able to present any evidence of physical harm to anybody. At the same time, what did WikiLeaks expose? Let's talk about journalists who were killed 
Remember the collateral murder video where two Reuters journalists were slaughtered with hollow explosive bullets, which are designed to penetrate tanks and armored vehicles. Let's remember the names. The, the excellent photojournalist Namir Nur al-Din uh, and his assistant Said Sma from Reuters. Let's not forget the, uh, that the WikiLeaks exposed the cover-up in Spain uh, where the government was complicit in, in covering up the investigation and the justice for Jose Cuso, the, uh, the Spanish cameraman that was bombarded on the balcony of the Palestine Hotel when the U.S. Army entered into Baghdad in 2003. There was a blatant attempt to cover that up. And those are just the journalists that we, are, that we uh, uh, exposed the killing off and the injustice and the war crime that was basically involved in their deaths. But all the other, the war crimes, the uh, corruption, the truth about these two wars, the truth about Guantanamo Bay, that is now what is, he is being tried for. That's what they, they want him, uh, uh, that in basically US prison for. And make no mistake about the political angle here. Uh, <laughs> When Mike Pompeo was, was uh, uh, director of the CIA, he coined this term that, uh, that WikiLeaks was a non-state hostile intelligence service. What does it entail? Yes, he was giving the, the argument that they would then push that this was not journalism but espionage, that they would go after Julian on that basis, the Espionage Act. Uh, equating journalism and telling the truth with, with espionage, that's a, what a signal is that to journalists? Uh, Pompeo, of course, has his fingerprints are all over the Julian Assange case. And uh, now we know that he is going to be running for the a Senate seat. And who is going to be his primary backer? That is a casino magnate called Adelson. Uh, incidentally, that's the same person who actually financed the disgusting espionage in the Ecuadorian embassy, the Spanish firm that uh, uh, was supposed to be looking after Julian and his security, but spied upon him. Spied upon meeting with, with, uh, with, uh, with lawyers, with Jen, with doctors. So to connect the dots. This is the political corruption we're dealing with. We are dealing here with a political persecution. This has nothing to do with justice. Yes. But we need to fight. We need to fight and tear down this wall around Julian. We need to free him. And I remember when, uh, when uh, shortly after he, he was arrested, uh, he, uh, uh, we asked him what to relay to the journalists outside. What, what should we tell them? And, and his remark was, well, tell them it's not about me. It's about them. It's about the future of journalism. It's the gravest attack on journalism that I have seen in my lifetime and uh, the most serious attack on journalism in, in latter times. And if this goes ahead, if this extradition goes ahead, we are entering in, into a, a, a new dark ages. And that is, we have to fight, we have to team together everywhere. Thank you. that eloquent defense of Julian and of the profession of investigative journalism from the Icelandic investigative journalist who has won three awards uh, from, the, from the National Union of uh, Journalists in Iceland, the only journalist to receive that. So um, thank you, Kristen. Our next speaker is Jen Robinson. Jen is a barrister with Doughty Street Chambers in London. She's a member and advisor of Julian Assange's legal team. And she recently provided expert advice on international law to the UN inquiry into the death of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Um, I'd also like to welcome to the stage Richard Bergen, who has joined us after another meeting. <laughs> Thank you.
Over to you, Jen. We are facing a situation where a journalist and an editor faces 175 years in prison for publishing truthful information, for publishing for the very publications for which he's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. He's won the Sydney Peace Prize and the Walkley Award in Australia for the most outstanding contribution to journalism. That is how stark the situation is and that is how stark the situation is that faces Julian Assange. I always think it's important to remember what these publications were and their significance, the publications for which he now sits in a high security prison over in Belmarsh. Collateral murder, evidence of a war crime, the killing of journalists in a conflict where they pose no risk. The Afghan war logs, the Iraq war logs, evidence of torture, the mistreatment of political detainees, the killing of civilians far beyond what the US government was reporting to its own citizens and to the world. Cablegate, the diplomatic cables that revealed the true nature of US imperialism, the fact that the United States was ordering the spying on UN diplomats, corruption, torture, human rights abuse, war crimes the world over. These are the publications for which he sits in prison. This is the very same material for which WikiLeaks and its media partners have been recognised the world over with journalism awards. This is the same material that has been cited in the European Court of Human Rights to hold European states accountable for their complicity in CIA renditions. This is the same material that was cited both before the UK Supreme Court in this country and the International Court of Justice in the Chagos Islands case setting a precedent that WikiLeaks cables can be used as evidence in human rights cases around the world and certainly in this country and in the Commonwealth. I think it's also important to remember that Julian sits in prison for the same publications which were published together with media partners around the world. De Spiegel, The New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, El Pais. But so far Julian is the only person that is facing prosecution for these publications. At least so far. Since 2010, we've been warning about what this precedent would mean. As the New York Times general counsel has said, it is impossible with respect to these publications to distinguish between what WikiLeaks did and what the New York Times did. For that reason, we've been saying for years that the media needed to stand with WikiLeaks to defend against this precedent being set because it would set a chilling it would have a chilling impact on investigative journalism the world over. Now that we have the indictment from the United States, the very thing that we warned about since 2010, we can see that this indictment is an effort to criminalise journalists for stock standard communications with their sources, for receiving and publishing information in the public interest. This is, as the New York Times and the Washington Post recognised, the criminalisation of typical journalistic practices that have been used for decades in the public interest. We talk about what this case means, and I think we need to talk about what it means for both for journalists and editors around the world with respect to the United States and what it, mean, what it says to other countries. This precedent that the Trump administration is pursuing means that any journalist or any editor anywhere in the world who receives and publishes truthful information about the United States could be sought for prosecute, could be extradited and sought for prosecution in the United States. What does that say to China or to Russia or to Saudi Arabia? How would we react in the UK if a British journalist published secret information that they'd obtained about the murder of Jamal Khashoggi from Saudi Arabia and then was sought for prosecution and extradition to Saudi Arabia to face prison, let alone 175 years in prison for having published that information in the public interest. There would be outrage, and rightly so. Already we're seeing in Bolsonaro's Brazil, American investigative journalist Glenn Greenwald is now being prosecuted on precisely the same case theory that the United States is running in this case. That is, that journalists can be criminalised and accused of conspiracy 
for the alleged illegal acts of their sources in revealing information in breach of their own legal obligations. That is a dangerous, dangerous precedent. It may now be Julian and it may now be Glenn Greenwald, but who will be next? I think it's important that Kristen referred to the semantics being used by the CIA. In 2017, it was Mike Pompeo who said, as then as director of the CIA, that WikiLeaks is a hostile non-state intelligence agency. This kind of semantics is the sort of thing we've seen from the US government in other contexts to justify previously unthinkable action. Whether we talk about torture and the phrase enhanced interrogation techniques, a term used to politically justify what is an, is an unacceptable and illegal practice. Whether we talk about unlawful enemy combatants, the phraseology used in the context of Guantanamo to lock people up in circumstances that we previously could hardly have imagined, in the United States at least. That is the precedent that's being used here, that a publisher, a journalist, and a journalistic organisation, an award-winning publishing organisation, is being branded a hostile non-state intelligence agency. We have to be very wary of what that semantics means, and now we're seeing it, not just in bluster from the director of the CIA, but now in the arguments of the Department of Justice in arguing that a foreign national shouldn't benefit from First Amendment protections. The extradition hearing is going ahead on the 24th of February. There'll be a separate three more weeks of evidence in May. Of course, we're preparing for a case that the world's superpower has had 10 years to, to prepare for. In circumstances where our legal meetings have been spied upon, we now know that my meetings with Julian were recorded and that evidence was handed over to the United States in breach of legal privilege. We also have had difficulty arranging access to Julian in the prison. We've had difficulty with visits. We had to threaten litigation in order to be able to hand him documents. He still doesn't have the correct computer facilities in prison to be able to defend this case. But we will do the best we can. It's really important, I think, to, f f at least, um, Julian has asked me, actually, I saw him in prison this morning, and he's asked me to pass on his thanks to all of you who continue to turn up to protest this situation and to provide support both to WikiLeaks and to the Courage Foundation, which is fundraising for his legal defence. One of the things that I've struggled with as someone who has been working on his legal team for the last decade, I walked him into the police station in December 2010. He has been under some form of restriction on his liberty since that time, whether it be under house arrest, uh, within the embassy, and now in a high security prison. I have had to continually resist the normalization of this treatment of an editor and an award-winning editor, and it's important that we continue to do that. So thank you for coming, and thank you for organising. <laughs> Thank you, Jen, for bringing to life what it really means when we, as Catherine Brown often puts it, weaponize positive ideals towards negative ends, whether it is about violence against women or about privacy or about what counts as journalism and what it could mean to other journalists and all of us citizens. At a time when we contemplate our democracy and our free press, isn't it revealing that the person who is behind bars is not the war criminal or the host of war criminals we know about, but the person who revealed war crimes? It is therefore my pleasure now to welcome Richard Bergen, who's the Shadow Justice Secretary, who has defended many trade unionists in the past in his previous avatars, and to welcome him to the stage to say a few words. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, and I'm glad to be able to be with you all tonight, even though I wish it weren't necessary for us all to gather tonight yet again to speak out uh, against this 
injustice. And it was illuminating to hear both Christian uh, and Jen talk about the injustice, talk about the situation faced by Julian Assange, talk about the situation faced uh, by WikiLeaks, and to hear from Jen that even legal privilege, the confidentiality of the exchange and advice given between uh, a lawyer and their client uh, has not functioned uh, in this matter. I think it's very important for us all to remind each other and other people we talked to outside this meeting about this situation, about exactly what WikiLeaks has done, exactly what WikiLeaks has achieved, exactly what WikiLeaks has revealed. Go back to April 2010. Between April 2010 and April 2011, in a 12-month period, WikiLeaks published the following material. First of all, the collateral murder video, which so many people will have seen, where innocent people in Iraq were gunned down, and that video went around the world and showed people the truth of what was going on in our name. The Afghanistan war logs uh, in July 2010. Similarly, the Iraq war logs uh, in October 2010, which showed the real number of civilians who'd been killed in Iraq and revealed as well instances where civilians had been, and how many civilians had been uh, shot uh, by uh, United States troops are being too close uh, to checkpoints, uh, including uh, people who are pregnant women, including people who, who were um, mentally ill. In November 2010, they revealed a quarter of a million diplomatic cables. And then in April 2011, the Guantanamo Bay files. It almost seems so well known has it become about the inhumanity visited upon inmates and prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. It almost feels who is always known this, but if it weren't for WikiLeaks, many people wouldn't have known this. The truth of what was going on there wouldn't have been evidenced, wouldn't have been public knowledge. So it's important that we speak up for the work that WikiLeaks has done, speak up for that journalistic contribution that has been made because if journalism is really going to hold power to account, if journalism is really going to speak truth to power, then they need to expose what the powerful do in all of our names. And WikiLeaks has undoubtedly done that. And it's, it's often said that truth is all too often the first casualty of war. Let's be clear about it. Julian Assange should not face extradition to the United States of America because of his journalistic work exposing... <laughs> exposing the horrors of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. It may be uncomfortable for those who wage illegal wars that the truth is known. But exposing the atrocities of war, as WikiLeaks has done, represents the very, the very finest traditions of investigative journalism. Just imagine how poorer our understanding of the barbarity of the Vietnam War would have been had those who exposed the US atrocities in Vietnam then been subjected to prosecution for doing so. Are we really going to hand over someone to spend 175 years in prison, the rest of their life in prison, for exposing killings and exposing abuses in Iraq in and Afghanistan, including the killing of journalists? It's wrong that the Conservative government signed the extradition warrant to the United States. It not only appears... It not only appears to be yet another example of kowtowing to US foreign policy, but it seems to me to be a complete
failure, a complete failure to respect the basic principles of journalistic freedom, as we've heard tonight. And this issue, I have to say, goes way beyond the case of WikiLeaks. It's a clear attack on all those who wish to expose abuses of state power, an attack on the journalists who report on them. It's deeply worrying implications for media freedoms, for freedom of speech, and for civil liberties in our country. And of course, as we've heard, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture has called for this extradition to the United States to be stopped. So everyone, everyone, regardless of their political persuasion, regardless of their political opinion, everyone who believes in free and open press must, in my view, join that demand for this extradition to be stopped. People will have seen today, quite rightly, in what seems like and what is a much more minor point, has been justified criticism for the arrangements the Conservative government has with press in the press lobby in Parliament. I do hope that all the journalists who have spoken out against that also speak out against the extradition of a journalist, Julian Assange, for this. So I'll conclude by saying that as somebody who believes in anti-war internationalism, in someone who believes that if we are going to be a truly democratic world, then what the powerful do in our name must be known by us. I'm proud to be with you, but I wish I didn't have to be. I wish we didn't have to have meetings like this. But without the work of WikiLeaks, without the work that they've done, we wouldn't know, and the world wouldn't know, so many of these injustices and humanities carried out in our name. So it's important to remember that. It's important to congratulate WikiLeaks for what they've done. The best kind of journalism is the most difficult kind of journalism. But who would have predicted some did, but who would have predicted that in our country, which boasts of its uh, attachment to freedom of the press, that in our country, a journalist for exposing these things would be at risk of extradition to spend the rest of his life behind bars. It's an injustice against him. It's an injustice against WikiLeaks. It's an injustice against all of those people killed in Iraq, imprisoned in Guantanamo Bay, or killed in Afghanistan. And as Martin Luther King said, an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. It's our job as human beings who care about other people to speak out against these injustices. And it's our job as human beings that care about other people to speak up for journalists who, for speaking out against these injustices and revealing these injustices, face extradition and face life behind bars. good to hear you say that to have somebody in a leadership position as you are to take who was take who's previously taken a consistent and credible left stance against inhumane behavior by our governments and our, through our foreign policy abroad call out this persecution of Julian Assange as Lisa Longstaff of women against rape often says does the rape murder and torture of those women, children, men in Afghanistan and Iraq not count. And I think she's very right in saying that. I'd next like to invite to the stage uh, someone who's taken a, a particularly heroic stance in defending us against torture. Um, he has served as, he's serving as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on torture. He's also a fellow academic and a professor at 
the University of Glasgow and holds the Human Rights Chair at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights in Switzerland, Professor Niels Meltzer. Thank you. And thank you for organizing this event. It's good to see fewer and fewer empty seats. And it's good to see more and more representatives of the press being interested. I have said many things about this case. I have come a long way myself in this case, and I've written many things about this case. I'd like to start with a metaphor that I have used yesterday and at other events, and that describe to me and uh, help us understand what's really going on here. This room is big enough to ho house a couple of elephants, but let's just say we have one elephant in the room. You switch off the lights, it's pitch dark. The elephant is over there in the corner. <clears throat> and now I take a flashlight and I point over in that dark room, I take a flashlight and I point in the other corner. Where will all of you be looking? The other corner, right? Now Julian Assange has taken the flashlight in that dark room and he pointed at the elephant. The elephant of war crimes, the elephant of misconduct <coughs> under the color of law, the elephant of serious violations of human rights and impunity. He's pointed his spotlight at this elephant and the elephant as, an, as a deer in the headlights was frozen for a couple of moments, a couple of weeks. Everybody was discussing these revelations. But then the elephant snatched the spotlight and they turned it over and pointed it at Julian Assange. The room became dark, and the only thing we could see in the room is Julian Assange in the corner and the spotlight pointing at him. And now everybody was discussing Julian Assange's character, Julian Assange's private habits, was he wearing shorts or long pants during his video conferences, um, was he skateboarding in the embassy, did he feed his cat, did he smear things on the walls of the embassy? I mean absolutely trivial things compared to the revelations that he made. Who is the one ha that has the spotlight? It's certainly the governments and the media. The media are the, the link. The media are the ones that observe the governments for us and then are supposed to inform us, to empower us, not just to entertain us. But if the media wants to talk about skateboards, we just want to read about skateboards. We're not looking at the elephant in the dark. And I think this is what this is about. This is why everybody's discussing is Julian Assange a good man or a bad man, or what has he done, is that a good thing or a bad thing, or could someone have been endangered, potentially, we, no one has ever heard of anyone being harmed by the revelations, but you know, theoretically it could be harmful, so, we have to extradite him to face justice. But no one discusses the people that were murdered on film. They were not endangered, they were murdered. And you can hear... <laughs> and, and, and you can hear the soldiers commenting. Now, I've been a legal advisor for the International Committee of the Red Cross. I've worked in war areas and I know that civilians can arm themselves, can become dangerous and become legitimate targets. Even if some of these people were carrying weapons, once they are wounded, they are protected. Wounded combatants cannot be targeted. Targeting wounded combatants, even if they are combatants, regardless whether they're civilians or not, once they're wounded, targeting them becomes a war crime. We can hear the soundtrack on that video. Oh, he's wounded fire. 
Yes, and then we, oh, here comes the minibus. He wants to, the driver wants to rescue these people. And then they're asking for permission to engage, knowing very well that they're shooting at rescuers. It's a war crime. There's no, it's not a potential war crime. It is a war crime. And who has ever asked for the prosecution of that war crime? We have the Senate committee report, 7,000 pages of evidence of systematic torture in the name of the US government. It's not true that no one has been prosecuted. There is one CIA agent that has been prosecuted for it. His name is John Kiriakou. He is the whistleblower who actually disclosed it. No one else has been prosecuted for the most serious crime of torture. So then we have, and, and there's evidence, I mean, that's the, a report by the Congress, by the Senate, that's not an NGO report, and I'm not belittling NGOs, but I'm saying this a branch of the government recognizing that the government had a systematic policy of torture. And there is a absolute unconditional legal obligation in the Convention Against Torture that was ratified by the US to prosecute every act of torture. It has not been done. But we're prosecuting the person that has leaked the information, Chelsea Manning, and we're prosecuting the journalist who has published the information. And then the UK is doing the same. The UK was an ally, obviously, of the US in this, and the UK Parliament disclosed, uh, investigated and uh, made a report last year confirming that the UK involvement in the CIA torture program was much more substantial than we suspected and asked for a judicial inquiry. Now, taking a good example of the American government, the UK government this summer canceled out this inquiry. We're not going to prosecute. But then, in correspondence with me, the UK government claims that it doesn't condone torture. It, does, it, 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 it is uh, you know, proud to cooperate with the UN Special Rapporteur. But when I make a report to the UK about its involvement in torture and I ask them to investigate their own involvement, I don't receive a response for five months. And then I receive a one-pager saying, we reject any allegations of torture and Julian Assange is being treated in accordance with English law. When precisely the opposite was the result of my investigation. But it's not common law. So, by putting a spotlight on Julian Assange, these states have deliberately created a monster, a purported rapist, narcissist, hacker, and spy. And this poisoned narrative has really intoxicated the whole public. I was intoxicated by it. I didn't even know about it. I didn't know Julian Assange. I didn't know about his case. But when his legal team approached me a, uh, a bit more than a year ago in December 2018, I declined to get involved because I had this visceral reaction of, I'm not going to defend this rapist and narcissist. And, and I'm the special rapporteur on torture. I mean, would you think I'd be a bit more discerning? But I had this visceral reaction myself. So I'm not blaming anyone for having this initial reaction. It's natural because we absorb through the media these types of attitudes. But then when, luckily and thankfully, this legal team approached me again and sent me a couple of pieces of evidence, I started to get intrigued because I realized immediately when you scratch the surface, things don't add up. This whole narrative is not supported. It collapses. And the more you start to dig, the more dirt comes to the surface. And so I was intrigued and I went to visit him with two medical doctors to have an objective basis, a psychiatrist, a forensic expert. We visited him for four hours. We had separate uh, uh, medical examinations and bilateral discussions with me. And we all, the three of us, came to the conclusion that he showed clear patterns of psychological torture. I reported to the UK government thinking, well, this is the UK now. I mean, that's the rule of law. I'm just going to, you know, they're going to investigate and we're going to sort this out and I can go home. Well, home I went, but I waited for five months to get this response that I told you about. 
And that response was just, we reject any allegations of torture. And then, obviously, Julian Assange's state of health deteriorated to the point where I was genuinely afraid he might die in prison. And let me put it, make it very straight. Psychological torture is not torture light. Yeah? Psychological torture aims directly at destroying the personality of, a, of, of an individual by isolating them from all positive influences, by manipulating their, their feelings, exposing them to constant anxiety and stress, overstimulating their nervous system to a point where the uh, forensic expert explained to me uh, the nervous system simply collapses at some point and takes uh, permanent damage. Um, some traces of which we could already confirm in those physical examinations. I was just profoundly shocked. I could not imagine a year ago that I would ever get into a situation where a state like Sweden or a state like the UK would refuse to engage with me as the United Nations Special Rapporteur that's mandated by states to investigate cases and to ask questions to them that they would refuse to engage with me. And then they accuse me of being, of having lost my impartiality because I speak at events like this. Well, they're not inviting me to their offices. And I'd like to inform the public about what the government is doing. And and I take pride in the objectivity of my investigation. I was reluctant to visit Julian Assange. If I was partial, I was partial against him. I didn't expect to find anything, but I wanted two medical experts to confirm it to me. Well, they confirmed something else. And I immediately recognized the patterns myself because I've been visiting prisons for many years. I visited political prisoners in the Middle East, in the Balkans, and they all showed this type of pattern after a, certain, a couple of months. So I was objective. I was neutral. I was impartial. But once I have investigated and I have identified someone as being a torture victim, I'm not neutral between the torture victim and the torturer. So, the other aspect that governments criticize me, they say, well, you know, Mr. Meltzer, this is not really in your core mandate. This is not real torture. You know, this, is, uh, this is, has nothing to do with your mandate. Well, let me just tell you, there are three aspects that are absolutely at the core of my mandate. This man has exposed torture, and this torture has not been prosecuted. That's a violation of the Convention Against Torture, and that's in my mandate. Secondly, this man has been tortured and continues to be tortured. Psychological torture, if anyone wants to know exactly what I mean by this, read my upcoming report. In two weeks it will be published to the Human Rights Council on psychological torture. Thirdly, if this man gets extradited to the United States, he will be tortured until the day he dies. Because the prison conditions in the supermax institutions amount to torture and other cruel and human or degrading treatment, not just by my standards, but all my predecessors, and even Amnesty International, that otherwise is not very supportive in this case, it recognizes that those conditions of detention amount to torture and other cruel and human or degrading treatment. There is no way he can be lawfully extradited to the United States, not because of what he has done, not because of what he will be facing there, so I think it is absolutely time for all of us to switch on our own spotlights and point it at the elephant in the room, to refuse to discuss the personality of a man who has done more than his share in serving our society and identify... <laughs> and identify what really is the issue here. We cannot have states that allow unchecked power. Human beings cannot manage unchecked power. That's why we created 
the separation of power, that's why we created checks and balances. Now, these checks and balances, these branches of government tend to collude with each other if we don't supervise them. And that's why we have the free press that's tasked to do that. But the press that doesn't do that isn't free. It's not a press at all. It is just a public relations department of those governments. <laughs> and that's why the emergence of WikiLeaks is just a natural consequence of the media failing to do their job. Because someone needs to inform and empower the public. And now it is up to us, because it is also, it is, yes, it is about Julian Assange, but it is much more also about all of you and your children and your families. And 20 years from now, will you still be able to know the truth about what your government is doing? Or when it has become a crime to inform you about what your government is doing with your tax money to other people that have not done anything wrong in their lives. So it is up to us. We have to take our spotlights in our hands and point it at the elephant. Thank you very much. wonderful standing ovation for the man whose personal and institutional courage has allowed us to take the torture of Julian Assange much more seriously. And at this time when we contemplate how the British government has been responsible for interference or cooperation as they will call it with the Swedish government, uh, where they send them notes which say, don't you dare get cold feet, this is not being treated as a normal extradition case, where where there is a denial of medical treatment by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to someone who has a tooth abscess that needs urgent uh, remediation, and where the conditions of Julian's detention, his removal from the Ecuadorian embassy, and his continued incarceration and his inability to, pre um, to prepare his defense are some things that we are taking very seriously. So thank you, Niels. I'd like to welcome to the stage John McDonnell, the People's Chancellor. Um, John has a long history of supporting those who have been persecuted by the state and for calling out this kind of behavior. So it really is a pleasure to see both Richard and you here condemning this publicly on behalf of the Labour Party, on behalf of the politicians, who are taking a stand in our democracy. I'd now like to welcome John, perhaps, to say a few words if you've had a chance to get your breath back. Thanks, um, thank you. I am, apologies for being so, so late. Um, there were votes in Parliament that Richard participated in and then snuck off, and I had to cover a statutory instrument, which is infinitesimally boring, but these things have to be done. I've only got another month, so I thought I might as well stick around and do it. <laughs> um, I want to thank the campaign. Uh, I want to thank the campaign for all that they've done, um, the assiduous nature in which they've campaigned, um, but also, to be frank, the courageous way in which they've campaigned as well in the face of the various media attacks and political attacks that they've that have been launched against them. And I know how difficult it has been for them as individuals, but also as a group. And I just... I just think it's an honor to be in, in the same room as Niels as well, to be honest. Um, the work that he's done over the years, but on, courageously on this campaign. Um, I won't, I'll try not to repeat what others have said, but look, 
the reason I'm here is in an act of solidarity. Um, I'm a member of parliament and the role of a member of parliament supposedly is to stand up for democracy and the democratic rights of individuals and to protect that democracy against the threats from wherever those threats come. Um, I'm also, as a, in my role as member of parliament several years ago, I established the National Union of Journalists Parliamentary Group. I was the secretary of the parliamentary group. And we set that group up, yes, as a trade union group to represent um, journalists, to ensure that we protected jobs and wages and trade union conditions, of course we did, but we also set that group up because we wanted to protect the rights of journalists and a free press, the rights of sources of those journalists, and the right to be able to publish the truth. And it's interesting, it was during, we went through the Iraq war, we were making representations to government about embedded journalists within the military. We also led campaigns on the assassinations of journalists that's taken place on such a large number over the years and is mounting it even still. So when this case came along and when WikiLeaks happened, it just seemed like a classic case of whistleblowing to expose wrongdoing, which was brutal, illegal, grotesque, and actually something that many of us have suspected was happening, but just couldn't get the proof. This made the proof of that brutality, the torture and the murders that went on. And so it was a huge breakthrough. And of course then the state in its, in its usual role has tried to close down the access of individuals like us, the access of civil society, towards that truth, and that's what this is about. And yes, it's exactly as Neil said, it's about an individual in Julian Assange, but it is also about the principle, about the protection of the democracy, that fourth estate that we established, as he said, the separation of powers, but also the ability to throw right on iniquity that was going on, perpetrated in our names. That's what this was all about, a fundamental principle. So that's why I'm here as an act of solidarity. I, like Jeremy and others who at the time, we voted against the extradition treaty that was brought forward. We warned it would be used in this way, in the way in which it's unbalanced in the relationship between this country and the US, a subservient relationship. We warned that this would happen, and this is a classic case of the use of that legislation to still voices and also to persecute, because that's what it is. And I agree, I don't see any hope of Julian Assange having any, any chance of a fair trial if he's extradited. So one of the key issues for us is to do everything we possibly can to prevent that extradition. But I also, it is also about what's happening now to Julian Assange. And who better to tell us about torture than the UN Rapporteur on torture? And if the UN Rapporteur on torture is telling us torture is taking place, to be frank, I believe him more than I would believe Priti Patel or, or <laughs> Boris Johnson. Um, so, so in addition to preventing uh, the extradition, it is also about our responsibilities to protect the well-being of Julian Assange now. Now I be, must be one of the few people that's trying to break into Belmarsh prison as against breakout, because we've sought to have a MP's visit, and I've just written again, I've just written to Priti Patel to say, look, why are the delays in allowing us just to visit Julian and meet him and see, just see his circumstances, so that we can report back to others and yes to Parliament on his current situation. And we're hoping with the continued pressure and meetings like this we'll get that access, because I do fear I do fear for his well-being, I fear for his health, and as has been said, over the years I've met and visited prisoners in their different circumstances, often in solitary confinement, and yes, in Belmarsh itself, which is a remarkable institution for anyone to maintain some form of health or well-being within it itself. And that's why we'll continue to press for the right to visit, not just as MPs, but others as well, because again, there's the imp impediments that's been placed before his legal team and other visitors to support him as well. Of course, the key issue for us, though, is to secure his release. Our view, very, very clearly, is this... And I, 
I agree. I agree. As immediate as we can. But, but I agree. I, you don't have to heckle me on that. I'll come and heckle you. I agree. We want him out now. Of course we do. And we'll do, and we'll do, as you've seen here tonight, we will work together to do that. Because it isn't, as I said, just about Julian Assange. The reason Julian Assange was arrested in this way was to send a message to anyone else who wants to stand up against injustice, to anyone else who wants to publish the truth that exposes the role of the state and the brutality inflicted on individuals that the state often has, anyone else who actually wants to stand up again against torture and against war. That was what the purpose. And in many ways, yes, Julian Assange has become the scapegoat of this administration and the American administration itself. But times have moved on as well. And my fear is that we now have in the election of Boris Johnson the most servile, syncophatic, syncophatic I suppose, obedient servant of Trump. And this time period that we're in now is, the, I think, the most dangerous and most risky for Julian Assange. That's why, I, yes, I'm here in solidarity, and I'm also here to pledge that we will do everything we possibly can to support this campaign and secure his release. The final point this is I think our, our appeal is to all men and women of goodwill in this country to recognize what a threat this is to all of us, to the democracy that we seek to preserve, to the rights that we all believe we should have, but also for future generations as well. Because this will set a precedent that will be used time and time again if we do not defeat what is currently threatened against Julian. Solidarity. It really is good to hear that from John McDonnell. And as a, as a campaigner, as an activist within the movement, I am I'm really heartened to hear that. While we recognize the, the pressures on and the work of those who work within the criminal justice system within prisons, we are under tremendous pressures of under-resourcing. This is also a time when we're calling out the political pressures that have resulted in a miscarriage of justice. This is a time when we together protest the lawlessness and the overturning of the rule of law, and at a time when we recognize that for those other than Julian Assange, black and minority ethnic people, Muslim people, who are put, Irish people who are put through the criminal justice system and discriminated against, we recognize that the cause of Julian Assange is also a broader cause. And the indigenous people. And the indigenous and people. Indigenous people. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome to the stage the organizer of the event, uh, John Rees, who's going to say a few words about the campaign priorities ahead of the extradition hearings. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'll be brief. Um, it's sometimes said, uh, sometimes said uh, to me that um, protest uh, doesn't work. But let's be clear, in what's been a long, difficult and often dark campaign, we have one very, very important example in recent weeks. The one thing, the one thing that has improved Julian Assange's conditions in Belmarsh, that got him out of solitary confinement was campaigning. It was campaigning by ordinary activists, it was campaigning by the legal team, but most impressive of all, it was three petitions by Belmarsh prisoners themselves confronting their own governor and demanding that his circumstances be changed because they were unjust and unfair. And I simply make this point. If they can do it, 
in the most difficult circumstances imaginable, you and I, with much greater freedom, can also do it as well. So it's really, really simple. Any campaign is really, really simple. Ordinary people like us do not have money, we don't have guns, we don't have the ear of the powerful, and we don't control the great media organizations. But you can contribute financially to this campaign on the way out. You can take the leaflets about the national demonstration on the 22nd of February, just before the trial begins, and you, come, you can come down to Belmarsh on the 24th and on every day that Julian Assange is being tried and make it absolutely clear to the Tory government, to Donald Trump's presidency, to Priti Patel, to the governor of Belmarsh, and to the judge in this case, that we are not going to have this man sent to America. It's not going to happen. And I can tell you this, I was in court when the American prosecutors said it. They only care about two things, the Iraq war logs and the Afghan war logs. And if you think it was good that you knew about those things, that they didn't stay secret, then your job is on the streets with us, stopping the person who let you know about those things being taken to the United States. Because this legal protest, this legal process is corrupt. He will never be in front of a jury in this country. He will only be tried by a judge. And when he gets to the United States, he will only be in front of a jury who have to be selected locally in Alexandria, Virginia, where 80% of jurors are employees of the Pentagon, the National Security Agency, or the CIA. He will go from no jury to bent jury, and you will never hear that voice again. So take the leaflets, give us some money, get on the streets, and let's stop this. <laughs> Thank you, John, and thank you also tonight to all those activists who stand outside Belmarsh, who've stood outside the Ecuadorian embassy, and who've stood in, in the rain, in the cold, in the, in the wet, outside, all the, all, outside the BBC, in Trafalgar Square, and across this city to help us recognize the, the blood sport that is the persecution of Julian Assange. I now... And to round off this absolutely distinguished panel of speakers, I now introduce one of the leading lights of the left, someone who's been a political activist, writer, journalist, historian, filmmaker, and public intellectual, written more than two dozen books on world history and politics and seven novels, as well as scripts for the stage and screen. He's also editor of the New Left Review, Tarek Ali. <laughs> so the popular refrain these days is that Julian Assange isn't a journalist. The implication here is that were he a critical journalist, we might defend him. Well, the people who are saying this, we know who they are. And let me ask them a question. 
Did you defend the chief correspondent of Al Jazeera at the beginning of the Iraq war? Who went to cover the war for Al Jazeera and was droned to death by the United States, especially after the head of station of Al Jazeera in Qatar, from where many of the planes were taking off, told the United States publicly and privately, these are our headquarters, these are our journalists who will be covering the war, please make sure you don't bomb them by mistake. The very first week of the war, their office was targeted and their chief correspondent was killed. He was a journalist. They have picked up journalists in Afghanistan who were not embedded journalists and expelled them. So we know what they do to journalists. In any case, it doesn't matter a damn whether Julian is officially a journalist or not. He has done more for investigative journalism over the last decades than anyone else, apart from Snowden. <laughs> Most of the liberal newspapers globally, after the end of the Cold War, had dismantled their investigative teams. Very few journalists employed as investigative journalists. Their numbers really cut down. So what would they have done? Where did their biggest scoops come from? From WikiLeaks and from Snowden. And why did these people feel obliged to publish them? Because they knew they were true. They knew that they were the only papers who could do it, that it would increase circulation, it would get them more credibility. And I really say to you today that our campaign would be more successful if the editor of The Guardian and the editor of The New York Times were with Julian in prison. I'm not saying anyone should be in prison, but Julian and WikiLeaks made the information available. The fact that it went global and was published in all the principal liberal newspapers globally is fantastic. But why is only WikiLeaks and its founder being prosecuted? Because they can't dare to put editors in prison. They will if they have to but they decided not to. They decided effectively to make WikiLeaks the target, and later as the slander campaign got into motion, as many have said on from this platform today, they began to say it's not a journalistic organization, it's a spy, stateless spy, and a, a lot of rubbish which we shouldn't waste our time on. The question we have to ask is will they succeed? They may succeed, unfortunately, in extraditing Julian, which is effectively a death sentence. No other way to look on it. The Europeans say we never allow people to be deported uh, if, he's facing, if they're facing a death sentence, but the American senators, numerous uh, other state officials have made no secret he will never leave prison. So that is effectively a death sentence. He's on death row. He will be on death row if he is extradited, which is why the cravenness of the British government, the Home Secretary, is so appalling in this particular case. And why are they so determined to do it? They're determined to do it, as John McDonnell pointed out, is to prevent other people from doing the same thing in the future, but it never works. And I'll tell you why it doesn't work. It doesn't work because when people, honest, straightforward people, including those serving in the intelligence agencies, or in the armies actually fighting these imperial wars, or at the State Department, as in the case of the Pentagon Papers during the Vietnam War, see some horrors 
they feel they cannot keep silent and that you cannot stop by punishing other people. That is an outcome of what you are doing yourself. I mean, these people who go and serve in wars, even the ones who don't speak out, have seen hell of a lot. They have seen people being tortured. They may have participated in tortures. They are told to treat the people whose countries they are occupying, their cultures, their institutions, with complete and utter contempt. And sometimes a few people crack. They cannot tolerate it anymore. And when this happens, they start to leak this information, hoping it will be published. And in today's world, not 30 or 40 years ago, in today's world, they cannot be sure, and they shouldn't be sure, that it will be published by the media as it is today. You need alternative networks like WikiLeaks to make sure that the material is looked at, edited or not, and then distributed to whoever wants to publish it. <clears throat> and you know, the ironic thing is that quite a lot of the material I've read from WikiLeaks uh, and the information they made available, the secret reports sent by US embassies uh, to Washington explaining what was going on in, in the country. The Americans should actually be grateful because it shows that quite a lot of their diplomats are actually aware of what is really going on in the country. They just don't want to make it public because in most of these countries they're supporting these governments, appalling governments. But privately, they send a report to the State Department or the intelligence agencies saying, actually, the guy we are supporting and his colleagues, they don't put it quite like that, are a bunch of rogues and crooks and murderers. But we are supporting them. But they have to know that these are the people they're supporting, so there are no illusions. So they should have been pleased that WikiLeaks have published this to show that they are well informed, some of these diplomats. <laughs> I mean, normally people think American diplomats are stupid, but actually, qu <laughs> quite a few of them are not. Hence, as WikiLeaks has shown. So WikiLeaks should get a tiny award for boosting the popularity of a few US diplomats themselves. <laughs> the thing which we also should say at this meeting is that WikiLeaks was given the information, as we know, by Chelsea Manning, who was then serving inside the United States Army. And Chelsea Manning is today being victimized for refusing to bear witness against Julian Assange. <clears throat> and this will carry on happening, that I predict. The Journalists, big newspapers might not publish them, but there will be people as long as these wars go on. And as long as the United States thinks that the only way it can establish its rule, its hegemony on a global level is by occupying countries, is by changing regimes, is by crushing the people. This will go on, people will reveal. There were leaks from the Vietnam War, huge leaks published in the Pentagon Papers. It was US, a US journalist who revealed that the Americans were using germ warfare in the Korean War. It was denied, the journalist was punished, but. It was, no, I'm sorry, it was an Australian journalist who, who first reported that germ warfare was being used by the United States in the, in the Korean War. So these things come out and they won't stop. And the best way to stop them is by stopping to wage war. That's the important thing to understand because <laughs> It was the Iraq war that produced WikiLeaks, the lies they told to go to war, 
the people they killed. Even Trump, in one of his more lucid tweets, said, I I'm against this. I'm, we should think seriously of pulling our troops out of Afghanistan because uh, uh, lots of our soldiers are being killed. And then he added, and we have killed millions of them. Absolutely accurate. And of course, liberal politicians poured scorn on him for coming out and saying these things. Because they tend to mask things, so they're said in a nicer way. But he just said it, and it's absolutely true. Even the most conservative figures now show that a million and a half have died in Iraq since the ch regime change in American occupation. We don't have the complete figures from Afghanistan, but they're in hundreds of thousands that have been killed in Afghanistan, together with rape and torture. That the wars in Iraq, the occupation of the Middle East, the war in Afghanistan has now gone on longer than the First and Second World Wars combined. That is the reality in which we live. And the reporting is very bad, it has to be said. It's, these wars are badly reported. And there's a history there. They were very worried by the Vietnam War because television, radio, and the print media in the United States and here and elsewhere tended to send in fairly critical reports. I mean, I can still remember a CBS correspondent, Morley Safer, going with the troops to burn a Vietnamese village, uh, showing the Marines throwing flamethrowers, women, children on fire coming out, and Morley Safer calmly said, and this is how we're fighting for freedom and democracy in Vietnam. Just like that. And they wanted to stop any critical coverage. So you had embedded journalists uh, 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 going in, uh, you had very re restrictive practices being used to prevent the truth from coming out, and it did. Chelsea Manning did it, WikiLeaks did it, others in the uh, Arab media began to do it. And as Niels posed the question, what is being done about it? United Nations commissions, the whole General Assembly is one thing. But actually, the United Nations effectively is governed by the Security Council. So these commissions can say Palestinian human rights <coughs> have been uh, completely eroded, if not destroyed, that there is torture going on here, there, and everywhere, etc. It has no impact, really, on the powers that run the Security Council, I mean, unless they want to use it which they haven't as yet. The United Nations essentially has become, for on most important issues where very good decisions are taken, a talk shop. And the United States, as the sole imperial power in this world, has protection against any persecution or prosecution by any international body. Not that these bodies would dare do it, and this is the other thing which we have to challenge, which is the complete disregard of any international norms. It's one rule for your enemy and another rule for yourself. After all, we know what has been happening in Iraq. We know what's going on in Afghanistan. Not a single prosecution by the international courts set up by the West. Why? Why? We know the scale of the massacres that took place. We know what happened in Fallujah in Iraq, where they were shooting wounded Iraqi prisoners in, in the head, saying that's what you do to dying animals, according to a report in the New York Times. No prosecutions at all by any international body. Why? Because they are supposedly our wars, and our wars are good wars and the killing the enemy is part of our patriotic duty. That's why in any system which was genuinely impartial, 
a legal system globally. I mean, why wouldn't Bush, Cheney, and Tony Blair be facing an international court? Why wouldn't they? So this is, this is, this is the context this is the context in which one has to understand what is happening to WikiLeaks, to Julian Assange, and why they are so determined to crush dissent. It's not simply, as has been pointed out, the case of WikiLeaks, it's other journalists are under fire. Don't do it again, they say. Don't do it again. This is what happens. Snowden has to go and live in Putin's Russia for the rest of his life, and Julian Assange will make sure he dies in prison. So if you do it, just see what can happen to you. Not that it's only people like uh, Snowden and Assange. As the United States president said, casually using gangster language not so long ago, we decided to take him out about three months ago, but then we waited, so we took him out now referring to a serving general in the army of a sovereign nation, Iran. <laughs> Who will prosecute them? I mean, it's an act of state terrorism openly admitted. They say they have the right to do it. Why do they have the right to do it? We're the imperial power. An imperial power can carry out atrocities as the European empires showed over centuries. We owe Julian Assange our support and support to WikiLeaks to carry on doing it, publishing despite the fact that Julian uh, is in prison. And we have to do everything we can in Parliament, outside Parliament, in the UN, wherever, to make this case something we might not win, but to make this case something that they won't forget, that there is a campaign, that people will fight against injustice and chicanery of this sort. And I want to end with a story. I was in Pakistan till two days ago where lots of young people are being picked up and arrested. For what? Charged with sedition for protesting the arrest of members of parliament who say things that the army doesn't like to hear. Picked up by the security services. Just yesterday, I got a phone call, because I'd been speaking with them and for them, that the chief justice of the Islamabad High Court, very senior judge, the fourth senior judge in the country, summoned the leading civil servant who is technically in charge of deciding who is arrested and who is not, and asked him five questions in the court. Why did you arrest these people? The guy said, I was out of town. It was my, my junior who did it, so I apologize for not being in town. And the uh, <clears throat> judge said, we know you. It wasn't you that carried out by the civilian authority. We know, i.e., it was the intelligence services of the military that did it. Why did you use a colonial law passed in British times and used by the British Empire, the judge asked, to accuse some of these prisoners, young prisoners, of sedition. Do you even know what the word means? The guy couldn't reply. Three or four more questions, and he said, instead of arresting young people who are protesting, we should nurture them, teach them that it's right to protest against injustice. And he ordered the immediate release of all the prisoners who had been arrested. Now. <clears throat> it does happen, and one only expresses the hope that the British judge trying Julian Assange will not be the will be the wrong sort of judge for the establishment. We know it isn't.
I'm just saying that there are a few judges who are capable of doing that in, in this country. Hopefully, as the case moves upwards to superior courts, we will find some judges who are prepared just to be decent. We don't want them to be any more than that. Just be decent and stop this extradition from going ahead because it will be a disgrace and a stain, not just on the government, but on the entire legal system of this country. draw to a close, could I firstly salute the courage of John Kiriakou, Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, and Catherine Gunn. And all other whistleblowers whose names I won't mention. The courage of WikiLeaks and those who defend Julian Assange, those who defend the truth, at considerable personal and professional cost. <laughs> Solidarity with the people of the countries that have been pillaged, those who have been raped, murdered, and tortured by an unaccountable and uh, untruthful government with a disastrous foreign policy. If you oppose state-sponsored torture, if you want our CPS, our judiciary, and Belmarsh to respect British and international law, if you oppose the suppression of dissent, if you support whistleblowing and the free press, I ask you now to stand with Julian Assange and to defend Julian Assange and help free Julian Assange.